Good morning. No, that was terrible. We're going to do this again. So I took German in uh, secondary school in North Carolina, and Frau Shin taught me to say, Good morning, y'all. So, Sudo, good morning. Very good. Welcome to Dresden, and welcome to Flock. That was like, you were supposed to applause there. That's terrible. Okay. All right, save that for the, save that for the cameras. So I am here mostly to serve as sort of MC and do all of the fun logistical announcements. So let's start with fun logistical announcements. Um, you are in Dresden and they speak German here, um, but you will find that your English works really, really well. So we encourage you to use that. If you have any challenges, don't hesitate to talk to the staff. Uh, you can find us at the registration desk right out here in front of the elevators next to the hotel's registration desk, who is also a great resource. And then people like me will be running around. Uh, on the back of your badge, please read all of these things. They're terribly important. Um, included there are phone numbers for Jennifer Madriaga and me, Brian Exelbeard. Uh, do not hesitate to contact us if you have any challenges, questions, or other issues. The sessions are going to be recorded. Um, we hope at better quality than in previous years, but we'll see. Um, but yes, they are all being recorded. We have two requests. The first request is don't touch any of the equipment, please. It has all been set up very carefully. This is triply true in the rooms that have wireless microphones because it could take us half an hour to get all the levels back correct and to pair the microphones right. And like, it's all kinds of bad, so please don't do that to us. Instead, if there is an audio or video challenge in any room, contact me, contact Jennifer at the registration desk, um, and we will take care of it. Mate Hushovsky is sitting here, is on lead for AV for us, and we are super excited that he is here doing this. So if you see him, buy him beers after the last session so he can still fix the equipment during the conference. Um, but otherwise, please be very eternally grateful. Also, Pavel Valina is running around as well and has been super, super helpful in AV land. Food and coffee. A uh, couple of notes here. There are going to be coffee breaks set up outside. Today's coffee breaks are sponsored by ARM, so thank them. And so thank you, ARM. If you have, I'm sorry? Coffee gets Well, you know, coffee, coffee doesn't need to, coffee doesn't have to tell jokes. Coffee doesn't have to ship on time. Um, if you have dietary concerns, food allergies, etc., please be sure to talk to the restaurant staff during lunch. Um, everybody who sent in a dietary concern, we have communicated those to the hotel. Um, they expect to be able to accommodate most requests. Um, how do I know if I get lunch? You have a badge because there was some question about that. Um, other than dinner on Friday night, you are on your own for food. Those of you who reserved in this hotel through the conference uh, procedure do have breakfast included in your rooms. The rest of you will need to look at however you made your room reservations and figure that out. Um, let's start with a couple of other things. There are stickers available for you to put on your badge to express your communications preference. I encourage you to consider doing that, and I encourage you to strongly consider respecting the communications preferences on badges that you see. So please take advantage of this. There is a quiet room that has been set up for your assistance. It is quiet, which means please don't go in there and talk. You are not to have a meeting in there. You are not to decide to do jazzercise on a really loud video. Um, you are not supposed to go in there and engage. It is a place for people to get away from the conference noise and bustle and hustle and to take some time out and figure out what's going on, check their email, relax, whatever. It is in the Loschnitz room, which looks like Lobnitz, because uh, it has a giant S set in it, and it is straight down the hallway this way, and there are signs that look like the no microphones rule sign all over that room. The hotel has accommodated us with an all-gender bathroom. This is actually kind of fun, having all these signs. The hotel has accommodated us with an all-gender bathroom. The all-gender bathroom can be found directly behind this wall on this corridor here. The other bathrooms are gendered, so please respect the signs of the bathroom you choose to use. And if there are any challenges along the code of conduct lines, you can find code of conduct information uh, on the flyers that you were handed when you checked in, and then you can report those kinds of issues to either Jennifer or me. 
and our contact information is on the back of your badge. Uh, there is no Wi-Fi information on the back of your badge because there's only one Wi-Fi network that makes any sense and it does not have a password. Rumor is it is also not currently handing out addresses via DHCP, but we are looking into that. Um, I don't know, maybe we'll implement DHCP v2. Um, this laptop needs Wi-Fi, so if it comes down to it and the presentations aren't working, everybody else has to turn their devices on. <laughs> Good luck. That, they did that once at an Apple keynote. <laughs> um, okay, um, we are in the largest of the rooms that we have, and you'll notice the round tables. Um, these are not where we send the bad children at Thanksgiving. Um, these are actually set up for use mostly during the round table sessions for groups to do informal meetings um, tomorrow. But I think it's tomorrow. It might actually be Wednesday. Uh, wait, today is Wednesday. Might be Friday. I don't, check your schedule and you will see the words round tables and that's when we put them there. You can sit there if you want, like knock yourself out, but the audio and video is set up for this side of the room. So if you can't see or hear, you're going to be asked to relocate as opposed to us fixing all of the video for your convenience. Um, and there really are supposed to be enough chairs in here if you guys would defrag and let the empty chairs be known. Um, couple of other activities. Tonight there is karaoke and game night with the, and the candy swap is going to be held inside of the game night area. Game night will be here because we have round tables if we need them. Amazing. Um, karaoke as I recall is next door in the Dresden room. Uh, there are two access points to Dresden. There's a door here in the back and then you can keep going straight down the corridor and honestly rumor is if you go down this corridor long enough you get to the Dresden room. I, it just dawned on me while I was standing here. I've never actually walked that far in that corridor, so let me know if that's not the case. Um, but we are super happy. Um, the folks who have organized that for us, and both of their names have escaped me, so I apologize. They are listed in the program, so please pretend that I read that. Um, this morning at 6.30 in the morning, there was yoga. And my understanding is that we had people show up, and that is totally awesome. And I won't ask anyone to do a sun salutation right now, but I encourage everyone to consider joining the yoga tomorrow morning at 6.30 as well. It is held in this room, mostly in this empty space right here, so you do actually get to see like sun and stuff, but you're on carpet and you have air conditioning, which is about as good as exercise gets as far as I'm concerned. So I encourage you to take advantage of it. We're super happy to have Suzanne doing that for us. Um, we have lightning talks scheduled for the last day, and we encourage you to sign up for those. Those sign up for that is at the ring registration desk. There are only plenary sessions today and tomorrow, so you will only have the privilege of my announcements for those two days. So I'm sorry. And I think, oh yes, two other notes. Uh, if you are interested in helping with audio video, um, especially if you know you're going to be in one room a whole lot and want to act as a sort of room chair, please see Mate, who has left the room, or Jennifer, oh, now he's over here, or Jennifer, who is standing next to him, and we'll coordinate getting your assistance. Lastly, um, you've all picked up t-shirts. We have given you the size that you said you wanted. Whether that size has any relationship to the size you actually wanted or not is something you have to search your conscience for. Um, if we have ex extra shirts, which we are expecting, we will start doing swaps for different sizes on Thursday, um, which is tomorrow. But we want to allow everybody a chance to claim the shirt that they asked for before we give their shirt away. And... I think that is everything that I have to say right now. Um, I want to thank our two primary sponsors for the conference this year, and that's Red Hat and ARM, so if I can get a round of applause for them. And our first speaker is going to be Matthew Miller, the Fedora Project Leader. Hi, that was Brian Exelbeard, the Fedora Community Action and Impact Coordinator, or F-Cake. I don't think he introduced himself, it's, it's, uh, so that, that, that's important too. This is like last releases or two releases ago's wallpaper, but um, I really like it, but I really am running the updated Fedora, just in case anybody was wondering. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, wait, water. Some logistics before I bring in talk. Okay. 
Um, so yeah, I'm Matthew Miller, the Fedora project leader, and this is the sixth flock, which is kind of incredible to me. I had to count it like three times before I realized what it was. Um, I like to do lots of graphs and things in my talks. Um, this particular one is a personal one about my uh, <laughs> optimism level over the years at flock. Um, Last year, things were kind of um, maybe a little a lot on fire feeling. There was some carrying around of fires, and I spent way too much time on this particular slide, everybody. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but this year, I'm really feeling good about things, both the project as a whole and uh, this flock I'm very excited for. I think, um, hey. There we go. Um, things are uh, you know, unicorns and rainbows kind of feeling right now. So I think this is going to be a really good conference and we're having a really good year in the project. So um, yeah, uh, welcome everybody and um, let's have a great conference. Um, I have a green dot on my uh, badge here. I hope um, anybody who doesn't know me comes up and introduces themselves I'm happy to talk I am Matt DM on IRC and Twitter and email and basically everything I can manage except for Instagram where somebody had already taken my name um, uh, please feel free to reach out to me at any time about anything um, I'm really happy to talk and to listen that's basically my job um, so I wanted to start out with some messaging stuff because here we've got everybody in a room so I think it's a good time to talk about some of these things. Um, thank you to Langdon for this picture of the Fedora Museum at the Red Hat uh, office in Boston. Um, this is kind of, the, the, the question here is, um, what is Fedora? And uh, I think hopefully everybody at this conference has an idea, uh, but messaging is hard. There's a lot of things that um, we keep saying despite ourselves. Um, one of them is, for example, bleeding edge. Um, Fedora is not intended to be bleeding edge. If there's blood on things due to using Fedora, in, unless it was some sort of medical situation, um, not, not right. Fedora is a leading edge distribution and we really try to not be bleeding edge. And this is a, a matter of uh, not just like um, language insisting that you know we're, we're better than we are or something, but um, Fedora, like we don't really try to be necessarily like Arch. Um, if something comes out, we have got it there the next day. We want to make sure software works before we get it to you. Um, so leading edge, and we leave the bleeding to other people. Um, unless you run Rawhide, then you're kind of on your own. That, that's what it's there for. Um, but anyways, what is Fedora? Um, well, the, the point of this here is actually that um, Fedora, these are a bunch of uh, Fedora operating system um, DVDs and CDs, but that is not Fedora. Fedora, like Solent Green, is made of people. Um, this is what Fedora is. When, uh, and so actually, I, the serious point is, I would really like us when we talk about Fedora to mean Fedora the project. And if we are talking about something that Fedora the project makes, let's call it Fedora operating system, or even better, Fedora workstation, Fedora KDE, uh, Fedora Python lab, and Fedora Core OS, like the specific thing that we're making, let's talk about it that way. Uh, especially if we're, you know, if we're talking amongst ourselves, whatever. But when we're talking you know, to outside the community externally, um, let's try and keep our communication clear that way. Because I think it helps people understand that um, we are more than just one particular operating system uh, thing that we put together. This is like the wordiest slide in my whole talk. Um, th uh, this is basically a summary of our mission. Um, and uh, this is you know, the Fedora uh, foundations here. I think everybody is familiar with these. Um, and I think um, this is, this is a thing that uh, makes Fedora special, uh, is uh, the way we have these values in this community. And um, it's something that I uh, spent in my job, spent a lot of time at Red Hat sort of f fighting for um, Fedora and the thing that makes Fedora special. Uh, Fedora is kind of unique as an open source project. A lot of open source projects are kind of a corporate open source thing where there's a thing the company makes and they put the code out there and you can participate in it as a community member which means you can chat on the forums if you can submit patches they might be accepted but you're not necessarily really invited to be part of the inner decision making uh, in fedora all of our decision making is in the public um, our fedora council is open to anybody we've got some hired positions that red hat 
funds, but um, that we have general elections for full council member positions. Uh, and this is really kind of unique and special. And uh, it's one of the things um, where uh, Red Hat has a lot of open source projects and a lot of open source communities. And a lot of them, I'm, I'm, they're, I'm not saying they're not genuine open source, but I think um, Fedora is the one that's big and successful and really has a community that's engaged in a way that is unique. Um, and uh, it's worth um, protecting and celebrating. So uh, one of the things that I you know, worked on in, in Fedora, there's kind of a lot of different ways we could go with what Fedora means and what the Fedora brand is. And one way we could easily go is Fedora is kind of an underlying thing and that um, our, our brand um, is sort of a powered by Fedora thing down in the corner and then we um, put, you know, um, other names up, you know, KDE powered by Fedora or whatever, or you know, CoreOS powered by Fedora, um, those, uh, or you know, whatever server, those kind of things. Um, but I've really fought for this idea that we want to have the Fedora brand and kind of celebrate a big umbrella brand where we allow a lot of things in here. And rather than saying, oh, that's not the way we've always done things, that can't be Fedora. Fedora has to fit this particular RPM format that has, you know, our packaging guidelines say that it needs to be this and it needs to be this way on, an, on you know, a DVD to make it be real Fedora. I would like to have an expanded meaning for real Fedora things that fit these values are not going to give up free software, we're not going to give up open source, and we definitely want to make sure that the community thing is there. We don't want things to be Fedora where there's something that, um, you know, Red Hat or some other company or whoever has exclusive control, uh, nothing that's based on who you are rather than, you know, your contributions. Um, but things that fit into our values, I think we should be welcoming to calling those Fedora and putting those under the Fedora umbrella, because um, that's a lot of what Fedora means to me, and I think that, um, we have a hard time recreating this awesome community and things we have here under another name. It's often uh, really tempting when you've got something cool you want to start up to be like, okay, I'm going to make my own new community for this. It turns out that's really hard. Um, and so we've got a lot, we've got a great community here. Um, and one of the things that's kind of a challenge for this community that I want to offer is that we want to make sure that we're welcoming to new ideas and new ways of doing things in this community as uh, the uh, operating systems change in the future because the things that were important for Fedora 15 years ago are not necessarily what people in the world care about and need in an operating system today. So we need to make sure we're able to adjust to those kind of things. Um, that previous slide was taken from the Fedora, new Fedora Docs site, so I wanted to put in a shout out here. This slide is to remind me to say check out the new Fedora Docs site if you haven't. It's um, very nice. Uh, um, this is also from the Fedora doc site. I don't have a good segue to the slide. I just wanted to put this here. Um, at uh, Flock in Prague, however many years ago that was, um, I started, stood up by a whiteboard and tried to draw a map of what Fedora looks like as a project and how all the groups are interconnected. And it was kind of a crazy web. Um, we have, over the last couple years, tried to bring some structure to this, and this is, with, especially with the Fedora Council in the middle, and this idea of having FESCO as an engineering oversight body, and then the Fedora Mindshare Committee for the things that are not necessarily uh, technical engineering decisions, kind of brings some order to things. Um, I don't think, I can't promise this is comprehensive, and maybe some of these groups aren't active anymore. It's a big project and a lot of things move around, but this kind of gives an idea of the scope of, you know, what Fedora is. Um, okay, now, now we're moving on to charts. This is, um, I, I don't know, I've shown this before at Flock and at DevConf. Um, it is a little confusing to read, but it makes perfect sense. Um, this is uh, a, using FedMessage, or message bus, basically a, a um, measurement of Fedora account activity every week. And it measures things that are easy to attach to somebody doing an actual action. Like if you do an update to an RPM or do Bodhi, uh, feedback that gets measured. Some other things like um, you know having a uh, Fedora event doesn't necessarily get measured. Like being here at Flock 
doesn't get you get a little ding on the chart, right? Um, so there's a lot of Fedora activity which isn't counted and even a lot of technical activity. So caveat is this doesn't represent everything. Um, but the blue line is the number of, is basically every week the number of people who showed up that week and th their account did something active. And it, again, it's things that are triggered by somebody doing something manually. Generally, think not you know things like if you had a, a script running automatically, it wouldn't get counted. So it's actual activity, and that's somewhere around 400 or something every week. Um, the solid bar here, the solid colors are people who have been active uh, in the last year at least 13 weeks. So basically, you've been active a quarter of the year, give or take, um, uh, makes it solid. So the um, blue line is kind of everybody's involved, kind of drive-by kind of things, whereas the the core is the is the solid numbers here, and the red represents people who have been. Uh, and it's not like danger; it's just the colors that happen to come out of the graph, and they they look nice and readable. But the the red is people who have been involved at that week. They've been involved in Fedora for at least two years. Before that, the yellow is intermediate people who had been at that time been involved or their their count their first time it had been seen was less than two years ago, but more than one year, and the green is new users. So um, I think that the main thing here is um, we're pretty solid, may maybe a very slight upward trend, but kind of flat. Um, I would definitely like to see more growth, but we're overall fairly healthy here. It's not like there's a drop off. And I would definitely like to see the green and yellow be thicker lines. I'd like to see more people coming into the project. Um, but it's um, fairly reasonable. We are getting new people in every year, and uh, that's good to see. But yeah, one of the things I really would like to see over the next year, the next flock, is a lot more um, new faces and new people coming in and, and staying around. Um, this is a new graph here. Um, and this is basically um, the, the same, from the same data source. Uh, for every release, during, during the time of that release, um, the number, the percentage of people who, uh, by which release they started in. So the dark blue at the bottom means they were what is it? Um, four year, four releases ago or older that they started. So for Fedora 27, the blue means they started at Fedora 23 time frame or earlier. Uh, and does that make sense? It's um, and so the green ones are people who are new in that release. And so again, this is, I, I did it, Brian wanted it not as percentages, but it looks like just random matchsticks of different heights. So this is, I think, easier to read as percentages here. Uh, basically, again, um, a lot of people, you know, old school staying around, which obviously is good. If everybody was fleeing, that would be even worse. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, upset about the percentage of old school, but uh, definitely uh, the, the new people coming on is kind of thin, and it would be nice to see that a little, uh, a little better at onboarding there. But overall, I think this is pretty healthy and we've got something like, what, 20% um, relatively new people every release. So um, I think that's pretty good. This is an entire switch from that kind of measurement. Um, this is just the, uh, the Fedora magazine. Um, and I was looking at various things across the metrics that I could summarize here. And I think this one is, is nice because this is basically page views per month for the magazine for the last couple of years. Uh, it's taken directly from the WordPress stats. Um, and I think the, um, the thing to note is, you know, especially the, the black ones are the square, the months where there was a Fedora release, which is obviously our most popular. And I think we're on track for some time in the next couple of releases to have you know, half a million page views a month view in the ma magazine, which is pretty amazing. You could. Um, if that were your personal blog, you could run it as a full-time job. So that's, um, I mean, if you wanted to put advertising on it, uh, which which we're not. That's we're not we're not about that. But it's getting to be um, a really popular and useful resource. So thank you for everybody who's works on that and has written for it. Um, it's a really nice and useful thing with a lot of information for uh, new and current Fedora uh, community members and users. All right. Um, next comes the part of the slides where I have promised. Um, Steven Smugin, who's not here, unfortunately, to show dinosaurs before I show it, because um, this um, is basically Fedora mirror stats. It kind of shows us how popular each Fedora operating system release is. And this is done kind of observationally. We don't do any tracking, so we're just looking at our Fedora mirror stats. Um, and unlike what SUSE does, we do not use a UUID, which I think um, SUSE is do doing it right there, um, because um, this is really susceptible to, to uh, network 
the way the network is laid out. So if you've got um, NAT, so you've got basically one IP address for your entire organization, you get counted once in this. On the other hand, if you're moving your laptop around a lot during the day and going to 10 coffee shops, you will get counted 10 times, at least as long as you do RPM, you know, uh, transactions every at every coffee shop and who doesn't uh, <laughs> right so uh, so yeah so that's the, the caveat and there's a lot of, of discrepancies in the number but I think they're still useful to compare release to release but I don't pay too much attention to the absolute number because I don't really know what it shows I would like um, in in a future version of this to have a UUID basically a completely anonymous not connected to machine ID random number that lets us just count the number of systems of each release out there and I'll talk a little bit more about that's important there's some uh, graph discrepancies which are obvious that um, w that would help us with uh, but anyways here is the um, release to release for the uh, the most current releases here um, and you can see uh, you 28 ascending with the bullet here um, uh, hey I have a graph in my speaker notes which is not showing up oh well um, the uh, the overall it, uh, overall is about um, slightly over half are on currently supported releases um, so like 30 percent right now uh, of all Fedora IPs we see are 35 percent I think are on Fedora 28 um, and then 20 something um, that makes it add up to like 50 four um, are on Fedora 27 and then everything else is previous to that um, and you can see the um, yeah the peak there Fedora what 24 very popular um, we haven't quite hit that with other releases a lot of times that's simply because the new release has come out very quickly on the heels of the previous one um, so basically every release goes up until a new release comes out so we haven't um, explored like if we just keep having our, like when we had a release that was out for a year that just kept going and going and going up so I don't really know what the ceiling for any individual releases we've never tried it we keep coming out with new releases which um, yeah obviously we couldn't just have one release and let it coast but just for a data experiment I'd be curious um, so this is um, the stacked graph of all of the releases um, and I kind of lumped them together mostly arbitrarily into these ages here um, where basically the green is the Fedora Next era um, and I started um, the, the orange I decided we change color since this is the first release with modularity enabled and I thought hey that's a kind of a watershed so we'll, we'll change colors there um, I might I've picked out a couple releases um, like Fedora 20 um, because that was such a popular release by itself it's colored by itself um, if Fedora 25 ends up flattening and staying high in the releases I might make it um, be its own color anyways that's Sorry, that, that's really a digression into things I find interesting but are probably boring. Um, uh, of, of the actual interesting things, uh, we obviously have a nice upward trend overall, but kind of some, I, I think there's some disturbing flattening at the end here. And one thing of particular note, you see a spike that goes down there. That is probably because um, when systems upgrade behind NAT, uh, for, for one thing, you're usually counted twice that day as Fedora 20, you know, 7 and Fedora 28. And then also, if you've got like three machines behind, you know, or 20 or whatever behind NAT, and they were all Fedora 27 before, and then one day half of them are Fedora 27 and half are Fedora 28, suddenly the counting goes up. And then when they're all upgraded to 28, it goes back down again. So that's why we get the spike that goes back down. And having UAUIDs would help us untangle what exactly is going on there and get a better count of things. Um, but yeah, I am a little bit concerned that it is kind of flattening off there at the top, so our growth is not um, the big upward thing we had been seeing. Um, so I think that's um, room for some more evangelism and trying to get you know more Fedora into people's hands. Uh, there's definitely a lot of space in the market. What's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Internet of Things, uh, so there, there's two things, I was going to talk about that later. Uh, Peter Robinson reminds me two things. Internet of Things is, for one thing, a big, big opportunity for a lot of growth where we could um, have, you know, orders of magnitude more devices running, which is cool. Uh, also, a lot of Internet of Things machines are not updated. Um, they're installed and then they don't ever check for updates so it is very possible that there are 10 million Fedora systems out there you know we see them sometimes um, crashed screens running Fedora 10 there's a lot of those out there that are not connected to the internet or not updating that are actually there that are not counted 
as well. Is that, is that what you wanted, Peter? <laughs> um, uh, so I mentioned modularity. Um, this graph has a much, um, wow, look, June 18 every time. That's awesome. That's because I didn't put the days on there. It's just the month. Uh, so you can see this is, uh, uh, right, uh, good axis labeling there. Uh, so yeah, this is um, over a much shorter time frame. So the graph is flatter. Um, this is basically the traditional repository and the, yeah. It would be interesting to see the repository. Yes, right. That is another thing. Um, OS tree is not counted in this at all currently. So um, that means um, Fedora Atomic Host and Silver Blue uh, and the IoT stuff are not being counted. We need to come up with a way to count those things, especially as we go to more um, OS tree based operating systems. Anyways, uh, the modular release. So the thing that's particularly interesting here, I think, is that um, we only enabled the modular repository for Fedora Server. So this kind of gives us a way to gauge you know, what release, speaking of um, the UUID tracking, we don't actually have a way to see what edition people have installed or are running in the current um, system. So that's another little tiny bit of uh, depersonalized data that I would like us to actually track this separately so we can kind of see which of our different efforts are resonating. Um, so this, um, we actually created an experiment by only enabling that in Fedora Server. So even if you're installing, if you're installing a Fedora minimal install that's not Fedora Server or Fedora Cloud and using the server case, that's not counted and we know a lot of people are, but this is like, how many people are actually running and updating to uh, Fedora Server Edition? Um, so, uh, to cut to the chase, it's about 7% of systems um, uh, seem to be uh, uh, checking into the module repository, which, you know, um, that's probably a little disappointing to Steve, but uh, it's, uh, I think it, it generally fits pretty well with our earlier estimate that about 20% of Fedora installations are used in some server context because uh, obviously not everybody's running Fedora server and not every Fedora server system is updated right away because uh, by nature server users tend to be a little more conservative with updates. Um, so yeah, I think um, it's probably a good guess, 20 to 30% of people using Fedora in server contexts, which is interesting because um, one of the things, if you go and look on Reddit, um, people assume that Fedora is not an operating system to be used in a server context. They um, go to Debian or CentOS or you know RHEL, um, which is obviously for many, many workloads, a awesome choice, but Fedora is uh, also uh, um, very suitable to a lot of server use, and it's an area where we've got a lot of um, room for evangelism and growth. Um, kind of based on what people are doing with it already, we can kind of tell that story better, and I think get more people using Fedora in that way. Yeah, containers as well. Um, particularly good in containers, I think. Um, this is a breakdown by system architecture. Uh, so we can see x86, 64, very dominant, and 32-bit, um, very flat, um, with um, some interesting drops. I don't know why it grew back up there. Again, there's dinosaurs in this data, so who knows what caused that to happen. But um, yeah, that big drop is particularly interesting. Like some large installation of Fedora decided no more 32-bit or no more Fedora at some point. And that is interesting because that actually happened a couple months after we had a big discussion on the mailing list about is 32-bit Fedora viable and it was looking like no. And it looks like maybe somebody was following our discussion and decided that they needed to find a different 32-bit solution. Um, and you can see ARM at the bottom here, and I did graph power or S390, not because they're not important, but because they would just be lines at the very bottom of the graph. They don't really, uh, and this is the same thing by percentage here. Um, I think uh, probably um, ARM is underrepresented because of what I was saying about things not, uh, not necessarily checking in for updates. Um, but there's a lot of room for growth there. Um, but ARM uh, still hasn't um, replaced the 32-bit uh, Intel architecture either. So make of that what you will. OK, um, so uh, I talked about Fedora as a big umbrella project. And one of the things that I think is pretty important to Fedora that we don't always um, give enough attention to is Fedora Apple. 
um, extra packages for Enterprise Linux. That's Fedora packages that are built um, to run on Red Enterprise Linux or CentOS or um, Amazon Linux or one of the other many rel der derivatives out there. Uh, this is incredibly popular. Um, actually, I probably did these slides in the wrong order. Here, this is the um, Fedora uh, operating system release and the red line is the Apple usage over time. And so um, it looks almost flat on this um, axis here, which is uh, kind of depressing. I mean, there's, if you look right there, that's still good Fedora uh, operating system growth, but um, compared to the popularity explosion of Apple, um, it kind of pales. So um, even if you don't care about that red line, uh, your impact as a Fedora project member uh, on the world is probably largest in, your, in what happens in that red line. So it's worth um, thinking about and caring about a little bit, even if it's not sort of the immediate thing you're interested in. And I think it's something we should make sure we're, uh, if it's something we're getting a little bit of short shrift in the project right now, and I think it's something we could invest a little more in. I'll talk about that a little more in a little bit. Um, yeah, back to this one. Uh, this is uh, broken down by by the Enterprise Linux release that they run on, and um, I think this is interesting for kind of two things. First of all, um, you know, RHEL 7 has been out for like I don't know eternity now, and it is just now almost taking over six. So Enterprise Linux users very conservative, and um, that's kind of why there's lots of room for Fedora to do what we do because um, we, we move fast, Enterprise Linux doesn't. Uh, and there's a lot of demand for Fedora-like content on Enterprise Linux, so I think that's a really interesting thing. And the other thing I want to point out is that spike there, and this is actually a moving average, so that spike is actually flattened from what it is. That is Spectre meltdown, one day. Um, all and it, yeah, it actually doubles. Um, at one day, for some reason, all the sysadmins in the world decided, today is a day we're gonna update our systems. Um, and it caused this very visible spike, and I think that's just amazing. Um, Oh yeah, uh, speaking of spikes, the other thing that I think is um, back in this graph here, um, there's these dips here. That's Christmas every year. It's the um, holiday shutdown for Red Hat and everybody's on vacation. Some stuff happens, but not nearly as much. And I, it's always fun to see like the real world hitting your data because uh, s stuff happens and um, yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, all right. So um, enough with the charts. Um, the, so um, the rest of the talk here, um, some things that are happening in the project and at Flock this year that have kind of caught my attention. Um, it's not comprehensive. There are probably a lot of things that I care a lot about that I didn't put on the slide. So if you're not in the slide, don't be offended. In fact, everything at Flock here, I'm very excited. Every single talk, um, there's not one that I would not want to be at if I could be in multiple places. So um, there's a lot of great things going on, but here's some things I wanted to call out specifically. Um, yeah, first release with modularity enabled. This has been a big um, project over the years. So yeah, congratulations to everybody working on that. Um, And uh, Langdon's gonna update us more on that. Um, I think, but uh, the reason I've got a slide here is this is something I think is important to us over the next year. Uh, we have this technology now. We've got something like a dozen different modules, which is not very many. Um, this is something that enables us to do a lot of interesting things with different versions, different compile options, like alternate versions of software um, in a way that uh, we haven't necessarily be done before. So for example, if um, KDE needs a different version of a library um, or a whole different like stack than you know, different desktop offering needs, um, there's kind of a way to do that and people can say, okay, I'm gonna maintain this separately. Um, obviously it's nice if things can be coordinated, but software moves so fast and there's all these different moving pieces and out in the world, the basic problem that everybody who has an operating system fit, uh, faces is, um, welcome, uh, the too slow and too fast problem where basically you want some parts of the operating system to move um, at a speed that you care about. And for some people, enterprise users, it's I want that to be very stable and never change. For a lot of other people, it's I want the latest version of that always. Um, and you want the other part of the operating system to either update itself 
or stay the same, but you don't care about it. But the problem is that's different for every user. Everybody's got a thing that they care about and a thing that they wish um, would just not bother. And it's pretty hard to make one operating system that appeals to all of those cases. Um, yet, it's basically our charter to try and make an operating system that appeals to everybody. Uh, so, how do we do that? Modularity and these kind of things enable us to make deliverables that have different use cases and follow different things. And we needed a technology which would let us package things up so we could solve different problems and not necessarily have every package be fit everybody's need. So um, we're going to need a lot more modules. That's basically what this slide is, is about. Um, so it was um, five years and two days ago when I gave this Fedora uh, Rings talk at Flock. Um, and we still don't have rings in Fedora, although we're ki kind of getting that, getting that way. Um, and basically the idea is, again, um, Fedora is a gigantic collection of packages and it is hard to treat them all equally and there's a big cost to trying making everything uh, be one unified everything. There's some very nice things um, that come from having one gigantic repository with every package in it, um, and I don't discount that, but it also comes with a pretty big cost for users and makes it hard to deliver things that fit exactly into use cases. So there's this proposal, um, let's split things up by policy and have uh, you know, diff different rings. Uh, this is an updated version of that same thing that from a talk that I never gave, um, I think it's even more confusing than the first one, but um, uh, Paul Frields is giving a talk later on kind of how um, a refined version of this and what we can do in Fedora and the advantages it'll bring us. I encourage if this is interesting and or scary to you to attend that talk. Um, I talked about Apple and its importance. Um, I think especially again with modularity, this gives us some interesting uh, abilities to make a better Apple. Uh, one of the, the things that modules have is this idea called stream expansion, and that's a fancy way of saying you can make a module and that will just automatically build across multiple releases. This is cool because if right now you're maintaining basically the same thing on Fedora 27, 26, 25, or whatever, and then on the Apple versions, uh, you might have basically one package that you're maintaining six different ways. Um, this can let you say, maybe I don't want to have um, six different versions that are kind of tied to what base they go on, but I want to have them conceptually. I have one that is fast moving and one that's slow, or one that you know conservative updates and one that updates to the latest version. And basically you have two module streams like that, and then you can build that same module stream for Fedora releases and for enterprise Linux, um, basically then letting the user choose, independent of what base OS they want, whether they want their, that package to move quickly or, or uh, more conservatively. And that then lets us also deliver solutions that use those packages um, in that way. Um, so the point of that is um, we can have an Apple that is basically based on modularity, at least once modularity tech gets into CentOS. That's why we've got a CentOS thing over here. Um, and then uh, with that, basically, it'll be very low cost as a Fedora packager to also have an Apple build of your package, which again, back to the red line, like there's a lot of demand for that and it's very high impact. So if you're doing this because you want to help users and you'd like to make sure that the you know, software you work on gets out there and used by people, this is an easy way to do that. So uh, there's that. And the other reason CentOS is up here is because um, CentOS is an open source project in the Red Hat family. We've got a lot of people who use both. We've got a lot of people who work on both. And we have not done a very good job of collaborating between the distros. Um, it's time to start doing more collaboration because we're leaving a lot of value on the floor, I guess. Um, we're basically doing a lot of work twice for no reason, and there are a lot of things we could take advantage of that we uh, aren't by not collaborating. So um, we should work together more, and Jim Perrin um, from CentOS and I have a talk kind of about some very specific collaboration um, in Distgit that is coming up, and I also encourage you to attend that, although I think we're running against other interesting talks, so you know, if you care about collaboration, 
<laughs> um, another very exciting thing is Fedora CoreOS. Um, this is basically an operating system that's meant to be kind of an operating system as a service, a very small operating system that will, uh, that's sort of specifically made for, or not sort of, definitely specifically made for running your workloads in containers and having the operating system itself updated underneath that without disturbing things, um, automatically updated. And it is um, very similar to the ideas we were looking at with uh, Fedora Atomic Host. And so um, Red Hat acquired CoreOS and uh, the CoreOS project is being merged with Atomic Host and we're going to have a Fedora CoreOS release with a lot of the technology from both and a lot of the ideas from both into an awesome best of the world um, container operating system, which I am very excited for. And I talked earlier about exploring new ideas. Um, there are a lot of new ideas that come in from that project that I wanna make sure we are welcoming to in Fedora with automated QA, automated release, and also automated updates in that system. Um, so I think that's very exciting and welcome to everybody from CoreOS to Fedora. Um, this is kind of a disturbing icon, but that's the best. Um, so this is um, the, the um, Mindshare Hackfest badge. So our Mi Mindshare is, um, uh, like I said, yeah, right? Um, our new committee for uh, basically the non-engineering sides of the project, which are, as you can see from the earlier graph, if you remember, a pretty significant part. Like we kind of tend to think of this as an engineering project, but the things around community, around design, around documentation, um, and, and the ambassadors like are equally important to, uh, to the engineering because if, the enge if we don't have that, the engineering doesn't go to anybody and isn't used by anybody and isn't useful for anybody. So this is important. Um, we had a Mindshare Hackfest earlier this year. I think it was this year. It feels a long time ago now. Um, and one of the things that came out of that is a plan for re revitalizing the Fedora ambassadors. Um, basically our you know, on the ground, talk to people, sell Fedora. Um, I, group and I think that's very exciting. There's some more Mindshare Hackfest stuff going on here at Flock. Um, and if you're interested in um, sort of leadership in the non-technical aspects of Fedora, if you're interested in you know helping spread Fedora, uh, helping those you know, numbers go up, um, I really encourage you to get involved in that. Um, kind of specifically, I was actually talking to some of the product management people at Red Hat and one of the things they're very interested in is seeing Fedora grow into the university student space, um, which we've kind of have been less active in than I would have liked to be over the last, I don't know, time I've been the Fedora project leader, I guess. I used to work at a, a university, but now I'm old, so I'm kind of out of touch for what's going on at that, that level. Um, but this is something, this is actually a project plan we came up with a while ago and didn't really implement on. Um, if you are a student, um, or if you are, feel connected to you know ac academic uh, world, um, this is something that really is looking for leadership and work on. Um, come talk to me, talk to some of the Mindshare committee. Uh, let's see what we can do to help uh, Fedora grow at uh, universities and among students. Um, the next thing, um, Fedora Silver Blue. This is kind of a. a uh, we, I talked earlier about OS tree based technologies. That's the uh, sort of. Uh, get for your operating system that Atomic Host is based on, rather than having your operating system be a collection of RPMs that you manage directly with DNF uh, or YUM. It's basically an image-based operating system that you can update as a whole to one version and also go back to if, you, if there's a problem with the updates. Uh, for a lot of people who are like hackers and tinkerers, uh, this kind of thing might not necessarily be the easiest for us, but this image-based operating system is uh, for deploying Fedora in big at big scale or deploying it to a lot of people who don't necessarily want to manage all the ins and outs of their operating system. An image-based operating system uh, makes life a lot easier and it makes things a lot easier for QA because with RPM as it is right now, every operating system Every installation is an individual snowflake with uh, the huge com the combinatorial possibilities of how you can put together Fedora as it is now are immense. With this, uh, everybody can basically have the same package set uh, on their system, and that makes it much easier to QA. Uh, 
That also means that uh, for actually running things that you care about, like applications and so on, we need new technologies for doing that. Um, containers are obviously one solution, uh, and that's one of the ways we want to have. Um, it's so that when you when you run do your actual work, you're working in a container, even though your operating system is this kind of image-based thing. Um, and the, also related to this is flat packs, which is a in fact, basically a container-like technology for desktop applications. Um, Snappy is another competing one that we're, so both of these things are things we're working on in Fedora. Um, there's an effort to take, um, flat, take existing RPMs um, that uh, we've already made. We do, we do in Fedora a very good job of packaging up basically all of the open source apl graphical applications that are of high quality are packaged up and maintained in Fedora in uh, pretty good state, uh, which is good. So um, thank you, everybody, and congratulations. Uh, so one, one of, one of the, the arguments for Flatpak is that it'll kind of expand the, the ecosystem of um, applications. I hope that's true. Um, but also, uh, we in Fedora do a really good job of providing these things to people. And so I think that Fedora makes a good source of quality, trusted applications. So um, Owen Taylor is working on a project that automatically converts the RPMs we're already making into flat packs. Um, so I think that'll be kind of neat. And it's a way also to increase Fedora's impact beyond the base operating system that we have. So if um, someone else is working on some desktop Linux, um, but they, their application, their their project is kind of focused on just the desktop. Um, Fedora has this wider focus and we package up all these applications. Um, so we become a good source of trusted, high quality applications for other Linux distributions. Um, that's a pretty good way for Fedora to increase our impact and also a gateway to the Fedora community for people who might have not start with a Fedora install CD. So I think that's exciting. Um, Here's another thing. We've got Ben Cotton here, uh, our new Fedora program manager. Um, I just wanted to introduce him. Uh, and uh, we had um, this last release, the, the, the first time we've had a Fedora release that hit our target schedule, which was awesome. And Ben will be doing that for every, yeah, right. <laughs> ben will now make sure that happens for every release from now on. Uh, so. Um. Uh, then this, I, I don't, I don't. This is a Penrose triangle. Um, it, it's impossible, I guess. Um, and so there's a talk that Josh and Brendan, um, who work on Rel uh, and on Fedora as well, uh, will be giving about the Fedora. RHEL CentOS ecosystem and how it all works together. Uh, this is kind of the evolution of the uh, what Red Hat once talk that um, we've had people from Red Hat leadership give at Flock previously. Um, this is a little bit less of a what Red Hat wants and a what Red Hat is interested in doing and is committed to doing and will be doing. Um, so we've scheduled that as a plenary talk because I think that will be interesting to everybody. Um, so that's coming up this afternoon. Um, and then immediately following this, we're going to have some uh, talks about uh, the Fedora editions and our objectives. Um, the objectives are a Fedora Council thing where we have something that spans like a 12 to 18 month time frame with a um, measurable goal and we have a leadership position on the council to make sure that goal happens. If you have something big you want to happen in Fedora, um, coming to the council with an objective proposal is a good way to do that. So we have some people who have done that who will be presenting on the state of their objectives. And then we'll also have overviews from our primary Fedora editions and what's going on there. Um, also, um, tomorrow we'll have an awesome keynote about um, if you see something that you don't like, how to make it better, or if you have something you want to do, how to make it better in general in open source. And I saw a version of this talk at TevConf and I thought this is something that we really could benefit from in Fedora community. So um, wake up early tomorrow, come to that keynote as well. Um, but up next, the edition talks. Um, do How are we doing for time here? I wasn't paying attention. Yeah. We're fine. We're fine. Okay. All right, okay, so. Um, did you have them in order? Do you want to introduce? Do you want to? You can introduce Matthias. Okay, Matthias. Matthias, sorry. Oh, bad. Here, you're a desktop person. Why doesn't this present? 
there's a reason why it was first up. <laughs> oh, oh, when I did present, it doesn't go to the secondary screen. Do I just need to drag it over, or is it? I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Does that work? Quick, back or forward. What? Yeah, right there we go. All right. <laughs> All right, I'll let you. Please talk into the microphone. All right. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Matthias. Um, and uh, I'll give a quick uh, update on the workstation edition and what's going on there, what has been happening in the last year, and what we're looking to do in the next year. Um, it's hard to go up after Matthew because I have no graphs at all, but I'll uh, try to make it interesting anyway. So, um, moving to the highlights, um, one thing I wanted to mention here is um, battery, battery life. Um, it's, a, it's something that we have been interested in improving for a long time. And in the last year, uh, Hans de Goethe has been uh, doing some work in this area. Um, he has been uh, changing a lot of things from um, um, hard disk power management to USB auto suspend. If you um, want to know all the things he has done, you can look at the change page that I linked up there, where it's all described in detail. And um, it's a it's a very useful project, I think, um, not just because it lets us all get more work done on airplanes, but it also gets us um, some quite nice uh, headlines and visibility that I've, uh, I've listed to here. So um, these things actually get noticed in the in the public and um, help us spread Fedora wider. <laughs> yes, um, keeping up with hardware is an, is an ongoing. Uh, project, of course. Um, here's one example that we've um, tackled in the last year. Uh, Christian Kellner and the desktop team has been working on uh, adding support for Thunderbolt devices to Fedora. And uh, that's a good example of a project that, that shows the scale of plumbing work that we often have to do just before we can put a new, new icon on the top panel or like expose something in the control center. This uh, fixing, from fixing the kernel drivers to writing a new user space daemon, in this case it's Bolt, that is a user space daemon that manages the Thunderbolt uh, security levels um, to all these things before we can actually uh, put some UI on top and make it all look easy and, and just work. But all of this is, um, is happening and landing in Fedora 29, I believe. And there's again a change page that you can look at if you want to know more about this. Um, moving on to um, Firmware updates, that's actually one thing I've, I was going to mention for Thunderbolt as well. That's another thing that we had to enable for Thunderbolt devices, making sure that we can update their firmware. And uh, this LVFS is the, the project that uh, Richard Hughes and my team is running for making sure that uh, firmware updates are a solved problem on Linux. And um, I think that's also a good project in terms of visibility. Um, a lot of the big names are, are present there now. If you haven't had a look at the vendor list, um, this is this website. You should go and have a look there. There's everybody from Dell, HP, Intel, Wacom. They are all there and all support this. And just recently, I think um, some people were happy to notice that um, their ThinkPads actually get firmware updates now. And yes, um, moving on to more hardware support. Um, what do I have here? Um, yes, uh, libinput is the low level uh, component that manages input devices. It's shared between Wayland and X. That's a good thing, and it has been around for, for quite a while. Uh, so it's not really something that we started in the last year, but I wanted to mention it here because uh, Peter Hatterer, who works on this, has now made a COPA available with the very latest Git version of libinput that you can enable and uh, help us test and improve libinput. Another thing I have here is um, the virtual box guest editions that we now install by default, I think since Fedora 28, to make Fedora work nicely in virtual box. And uh, over here on the, on the left side, the screenshot shows um, some of the work we've done on improving the handling of multiple monitors and monitors in general. In the desktop, you can see like the uh, high DPI scaling now supports not just once and twice, but also intermediate levels of scaling, things like that. Right. Um, Pipewire is the next thing. The, the screenshot here shows uh, Wim and Christian testing Pipewire using a webcam. I think that was actually testing like some effects or something. And um, Pipewire is, uh, is a new project that aims to do for video what Pulse Audio did for audio, I guess you can say. It's basically managing video streams 
inside the kernel and um, efficient, efficiently. And um, the short-term goals for, for pipe, Pipewire include replacing pause audio, because if you can manage video streams, then audio is not that hard. And, um, and also uh, supporting screencasting and desktop remoting under Wayland. We'll use Pipewire for that as well. And the longer-term goals include also supporting Jack applications and professional audio. And finally, having a unified base for media, essentially. And um, yeah, that, that's fairly young. We started that towards the end of last year. And I think there's a Hackfest this fall. If you're really interested in, in contributing in this area, you could look that up and, and work on that. And if you're in general interested in more information about Pipewire, you can also follow that link up there to the uh, blog post that Christian wrote about it. Yes, this is um, a quick run through some of the other things that we've done in the past year. There's a lot of ongoing improvements in the desktop that just like come in from upstream. Some of them we are directly involved in, some are just like stuff that happens in the community. And I'm not going to read that whole list, maybe just calling out one thing here. You can actually run Firefox natively on Wayland now. There's a separate package for that called firefox Wayland, I believe. Maybe worth trying out. And the screenshot here shows uh, support for emoji. That's, of course, everybody's favorite. Right. Um, you already saw my thunder here, more or less. Um, Silver Blue is a new initiative that we started this year at DEF CONF. It's basically about <coughs> making Fedora Atomic Workstation ready for prime time and expose it to a wider audience. And I should take a step back and say that we had an atomic variant of the workstation for a few years now, I think since Fedora 25. It was um, hosted in inside Project, Project Atomic and was a little under the radar, I guess, a little, little known. Few people tried it and liked it, but we didn't really advertise it. And Silver Blue is about changing that and basically making it ready for prime time and using it to spread Fedora wider. And yeah, what does it mean to make it ready for prime time? I've listed a few of the things there that we're working on. We need first class support for Flatpak and RPM OS3 in, in GNOME software. <coughs> to have a working solution for updating the software on, on Silverblue because Silverblue is using OS3, as Matthew already said. And um, that also means including uh, support for package layering and support for automatic updates. And it also means um, better support for containers in the desktop. Uh, Debashi and my team is looking at um, writing something like a toolbox container that basically is a fedora in a box that you can just use on an atomic system because you cannot just install an RPM if you miss something so you go into a container and you do it there. Uh, we're hoping to land some, some preview of that in Fedora 29 and then we also look at uh, integrating that nicely with the terminal so you can actually get some context information about whether you are inside a container or outside or things like that. What else did I want to say here? Yes, um, the name certainly has, uh, I've had uh, varied reactions to the name. It's um, not everybody's favorite, but it's a new name. And we also have a new logo and a new website. This is just because we want to reach a wider audience here and spread Fedora, as, you, as Matthew already said. The graph looked kind of flat at the end. And so all, the, all of these new things are a means to that end. Names are hard. So yes. uh, I, I think it's one of those things that sounds kind of funny at first, but after you start using it for a while, it becomes very natural. Yeah. That's true with any kind of name for things. So. Right. And um, yeah, another thing that we are trying to reach new audiences here is we are going away from using a mailing list and instead we are trying to use discourse, like a web forum essentially. I think Matthew is going to have a discussion about that. Is it today or tomorrow? I don't know. Okay, so it, it's trying new things and trying to reach new audiences. It's sometimes hard for old timers like me, but uh, I think it's, it's a good thing to do every now and then. And this is my last slide, a quick view of, at what's coming in the next year. What we're currently working on, there's things like uh, Smooth Boot, Peter Jones, maybe here somewhere, is working on that. And we're working on um, better support for the NVIDIA driver for XVALENT and for hybrid graphics. Um, yeah, Wayland screen sharing and remoting, I already mentioned that we're using Pipewire for that. That's hopefully going to be supported in Fedora 29. Um, game mode is um, about um, uh, battery life again, or basically the opposite of saving battery life. It's making it so that you can run your games at full blast. Um, yeah, you, uh, Matthew already mentioned that uh, Owen is working on building flat packs inside Fedora from RPMs. I think Owen is talking about that on Friday, so you can go there if you want to hear more about that. Um, yes, we're 
We are working on bringing automatic updates and full RPM OS3 support in GNOME software. That should mostly land in Fedora 29. Maybe some of it will go into Fedora 30. And uh, yeah, but I just mentioned we work on better support for containers and a toolbox container, uh, mainly for Silverblue. And with that, I'll hand the microphone to who's next. Brian's good introductions. He's next. He is, he is left building. Well, in that case, All right, well, uh, I'll just, so I guess, nominate sure. Steve Gunn. I made you a slide. Where'd it go? Right. Good morning. So for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Stephen Gallagher. Um, I have more or less been, uh, I don't like to say I'm, I lead the uh, server edition. I, I, f I feel like I, I more just make sure everybody shows up to the meetings because I'd really I, I really prefer that it be a community a, a kind, a kind of a round table situation where everybody who shows up has an equal voice so uh, I mostly do this because I'm the le at least squeamish about pu public speaking of the members <laughs> uh, so this last year has been a really interesting one uh, in the may you live in interesting times uh, sort of way for the Fedora Server Edition. We have had, uh, in the same 12-month period, a fair, uh, a fairly, uh, some fairly large disasters, followed by one of our, I think, what is probably Server Edition's biggest success to date, uh, which has then uh, led us into an identity crisis. So let me see where to start. Uh, when I stood up, uh, when I stood up and gave my uh, State of the Server Union uh, last year at Flock, uh, and I'm going to try not to cover too much of what I'm going to cover in that talk later today or uh, tomorrow, I was pitching that uh, the Server Edition was going full in on modul modularity, which Matthew has talked about a little bit, and and we did, and we we put uh, Red Hat put a lot of resources towards this, and we were building this really neat idea where everything in the system was a module. You could move which, whichever piece of your system you wanted at any given moment, and it turned out that that really was both not possible and really hard to get people to try uh, to try out. In which order? I'm sorry. In which order? It's not possible to have to try. Uh, well. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so the question was, if, uh, if it's not possible, how could they try it? You're, you're catching on. <laughs> uh, it really, it, uh, th there were a whole lot of bootstrapping problems. So um, we, were, we were faced with a decision. Uh, we got, this was uh, October or November of last year, uh, so a few months after Flock. And we either had, we were either going to toss it and scrap the plan, or we try, we're going to try something new. And uh, several, uh, several people, uh, basically had an, an international hack fest for uh, for about two uh, two weeks and came up with a way to reuse as much as possible of what we had already done and we came up with a new approach and we we pitched it to Red Hat and they decided to keep moving with it and moving forward with it and we got it into Fedora 28 and uh, we we delivered it as part of the default of Fedora 28 server edition and it actually worked for the most part uh, we had a, we had a few bugs with package kit but uh, we actually were able to prove that it is possible to build a, a, syst a modular a system. We just couldn't start. We we couldn't start from the ground up. We had to we had to take the existing system and make and start breaking off chunks until it, and until eventually we hope to get to that final place. But it was we were approaching it from the wrong direction. Uh, and and uh, why are we doing this? Uh, Matthew also talked a little bit about that. He gave most of my talk, so this is a. Uh, a little tricky here. He, uh, it, it's about solving the too fast and too slow problem. Uh, uh, Matthew alluded to the uh, Venn diagram of that. Uh, I wanted to give you a, a visual, and I was I was scrambling uh, a little while ago to see if I could find one slide to put up here. But uh, so I'm going to have to ask you to use your imaginations for this one. Um, think of any three or four year old child you've ever seen playing with an ink stamp. 
that is what the Venn diagram of people who's, uh, people, uh, people's, I want this to be stable and I want this to be, uh, to be fast, uh, looks like. Just punch a bunch of stamps on the page and that's, that's what it looks like. There is absolutely no two uh, customers or users for whom, that, uh, for whom those sets of packages are going to be the same. So that's why we. Uh, so that is why we did uh, we did this modularity thing. Now, where did that lead us? It led us to a place where we realized we've actually we, we've accomplished this. Uh, there are some, a few bugs remaining to be worked out, but once that is finished, we don't actually know where to go next. Uh, we've built a, we've built something that. Um, once we can get it into uh, into Apple, once we can get it to, uh, to work on uh, on an enterprise Linux system, we now have to figure out what does so server edition do, because realistically, uh, we know that what people are going to do is they're going to prefer to take an Apple base and or to take an, an enterprise Linux base and use modules in Apple. Um, there's still uh, there, and there's still value to Red Hat at least uh, for the server edition to make sure that that, that it continues to be a platform where we uh, do integration testing. You know, to, to for things that will eventually become an enterprise Linux itself as well. But we don't know. It, we're pretty confident that that isn't going to uh, gather a huge amount of community interest, and we're not going to have people coming out of the woodwork to say, "Ooh, I really want to work on that driver." Or I, uh, ooh, I really, really want to uh, want to get uh, eke, uh, one hundredth of a percent of performance out of the uh, out of the kernel today. People are doing that, and they're doing that outside of us. The server edition needs a uh, needs a target and a goal, and it needs to needs to have a, a new purpose. And that's uh, I'm, I'm not going to spoil my entire talk for tomorrow, but that's basically going to be the gist of it. Uh, we need to find. Uh, our, our new way forward and uh, I encourage, I, I beg in fact, any of you who have any interest in this whatsoever to come to that talk. It's, not, it's going to be about 10 minutes of talk that will be very similar to what you just heard and then a discussion. Uh, I really want to hear from anybody that has ideas. So we are actually going to break a little early for the coffee break because of the way the speakers are organized. So that should work out really well. Um, it is currently 10.18, so why don't we try to resume here at about 10.45, so we'll give those speakers some time on the other end if we need it before lunch. Uh, the coffee break today is sponsored by ARM, and it is set up in the lobby, and I encourage you to enjoy it. There are regrettably no RPM transactions available with your coffee.